I started this channel over four and a half years ago and despite pretty much making four and a half years of CSS content, I still haven't run out of things to talk about and with where CSS is headed now, it doesn't look like I'll be running out anytime soon. There's just so many amazing things that are coming to CSS and I had none other than Adam Argyle join me to talk about some of the things he's most looking forward to. If you don't already know Adam, he works over on the Google Chrome team as a CSS developer advocate and he's just up to a lot of really, really awesome stuff. So I've linked to his YouTube channel, his GUI challenges and more of the things he's up to in the description below if you'd like to check those out. And he's also just an all around awesome guy who was kind enough to join me for an interview about all of this. So what I did is I took that interview that we did live over on Twitch, cut it down a little bit, and I also added code samples and examples of what he was talking about throughout so you can help visualize a little bit of the different things we were talking about along the way. And without further ado, let's go and jump into it. I'll, let's do a flat list of just all the things. It's 11, I chose 11 uh, for like this short version. And I have color level four and five, at nest, at layer, at scroll timeline, at container, custom at media variables, um, at reduced data, um, at property, aspect ratio. That's funny. I almost said at ratio, at pect ratio, just because it all started with at so far. Aspect <laughs> ratio, <laughs> conic gradients, and focus within. So those are my 11. Most of these are in the moderate to low risk. So like you can get started with a lot of these. And if something is high risk, what I meant is like, it's impossible for you to do otherwise. So like something is high risk if it's like at scope. You don't actually have real scoping in CSS. Everything kind of always goes all the way down. But what at scope is going to allow you to do is say, apply these styles two layers down and then cut off. No longer will that color trickle all the way down. I mean, I guess you get that with Shadow DOM, um, but this would be a much easier way. So yeah, it's a high risk item because, well, you can't really enforce it until the browser has that feature. So if something is in pause, it's like, there's even things like new relative units, uh, which we're not gonna go into, but there's new relative units coming out and you can't really simulate those. Right, They're yeah. units coming from the internal browser engine and all the context it knows about, like you just can't. So it's high risk, don't use <laughs> until it's out and available. Or it's high risk because it's subject to change, right? It's a draft, it's a proposal. You could go um, hack against this right now and use all the uh, latest features that it's like articulated but it might change on you. And at which point you'll have to go adjust your code, which is fine. So it's like, it's high risk, but early adopters could be there if you want to. It's like something early adopters are in, in it for. They're like, oh yeah, I know. I like the high risk. Uh, it's my middle name. Uh, and then, or, or it could be like, it's high risk because it's unofficial and it's not blessed by the working group. So that could be something like maybe a working group member ideated it and they've talked about it and they've proposed it, but the rest of the group has not confirmed well, then it's a high risk item. That is uh, just a willy nilly thought in someone's brain. Okay, so then we have like moderate risk and that's uh, where you could start practicing something. So you can use it at author time, but maybe it's pre-processed away. Um, and so that's why I call that a moderate risk is it's gotta be somewhat stable. At least one browser or something has probably got this prototyped or done in the browser. And now you're using pre-processors to author it writing as if it's available, but delivering a style sheet that works for all older browsers. So um, you'll find a lot of the ones we talked about today are moderate. Now these can still change so because the spec is in draft or it's in development, but it's, it shouldn't change as much, like enough of it is firm. Often moderate things can be polyfilled, right? So this was something the high risk ones couldn't do. They couldn't be polyfilled. A moderate risk one as well. It can be polyfilled, like at scroll timeline is amazing. It's so much fun. It's really only behind flags in any browser, but you can go deploy the polyfill and write in your CSS as if you were writing it this whole time and it would just runs the client side runtime engine that fulfills the, the scroll. Um, it's really cool. Um, or it can be prototyped. So like you can get it in a browser um, and prototype it with JavaScript, whatever this functionality that will be eventually in the browser. So that's moderate. And then low risk is the spec is stable. It's available in at least one browser in a stable uh, one browser. It has a progressive enhancement path. So like aspect ratio, I put this as low because well, you can use the padding hack until then. Yep. Or you can just define some, and, and you can use add supports to check for it. And then the last thing about low is like maybe there's tooling. So kind of like the preprocessor path, like you can do it today and just not deliver it that way until later. So we do this with modules too within JavaScript, right? You've got your like, uh, well, maybe you do, but you've got like your older bundle uh, that's all um, IE ready and old Safari ready. And then you have your new modern ES bundle um, that's sort of much more slim. Uh, so yeah, that's the risks. Those are the 11 items. One of the things there that you mentioned was the progressive enhancements. And I do think that's, you know, 
you can even for me like on my own website i'm using um masonry grid on a grid i have just because i'm like if it doesn't work and most people it won't work but it's okay it's still functional it just doesn't look as pretty because there's a little bit the spacing's not like all glued in <gasps> a gap tight. yeah i yeah, exactly um just really quickly because i know some people who follow me are pretty advanced level and other people are newer to the the whole world of front-end development um so for a polyfill do you want to explain just quickly not going in depth on how they work but maybe just how you even you know or what it is and how you would find one yeah so polyfill is intended to match a spec so there's like polyfills and shivs and something else and they all have like these slightly different things but well what a polyfill is originally supposed to do is uh, its goal is to be a drop-in script a javascript file usually although i think there might be css ones but mostly javascript where you uh load it onto your page and for whatever way it wants to do it, like it could read your actual style sheets or it could just go read attributes off your elements or whatever, it's going to go simulate and create the context and the, the data that's needed to perform a certain layout type. So like a, we talked about at scroll timeline. At scroll timeline allows you in CSS to say, um, as this page is being scrolled, take that tick and animate something um, as if you were playing and dragging this scrubber on like a timeline. Mm -hmm. And so what you can do in JavaScript is, well, you load in the polyfill and that polyfill will go read all the styles in the style sheet, look for those at scroll time definitions, read everything that you wrote in that CSS, and then go write JavaScript that will watch scroll of that body and map the scroll position back into a tick for your animation. So it basically tries to um, fulfill the goals of a spec or of a CSS feature or of a JavaScript feature um, so that you can use it under the assumption that the browser does have it. Uh, it's almost like you're teaching the browser a new trick before it's available so that you can use the trick. Yeah, you're like bringing the learning along with you. But the bummer is, yeah, it's a runtime learning. So you can maybe bring too many of them and now your site's getting slow because you're teaching every browser eight new tricks so that you can use the eight new latest hotnesses. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the idea is you're teaching the browser a new trick so that you can use it um, Good call, though, on uh, <laughs> making sure that I don't go too advanced for too long. Because, yeah, some of this stuff is advanced. Like, at layer, like, that one's pretty heavy. Um, so, wait, yeah. so um, the at layer, you, you mentioned it. We, how, what, <laughs> Transition. What, what, what would, yeah, what would at layer, <laughs> what is at layer and what would it do? Okay, so at layer, um, let me outline a problem. Um, in your style sheet, the first couple things you write is probably, like, import, reset, import normalize, import bootstrap, and then you get into this uh, dance where you're just like, okay, my styles need to be loaded after bootstrap so that all of mine can you know, work on top of bootstrap, right? You have this concept of like, the first file that was loaded is probably gonna be squashed by something after it. And so you have to be really careful about the way that you manage your, your files in the loading sequence because Right. And you also have things being loaded in the head tag. Maybe you have JavaScript that's creating style sheets that are being put into the body tag. Basically, you have styles coming in from all these different directions, whether it's imports or links or JavaScript. And um, they're all sort of competing to be on the page and then be in this cascade. And it's just a lot of layers to think about. And so what at layer lets you do is I like to think of them like sim links or like a, a namespace for you to insert um, styles. And I think SAS has something of this concept, but essentially you'd be like, um, create a new layer. So you'd say like at layer and you give it a name and let's just call it like resets. And then you open up your curly brackets or whatever, or you could import a file into there. Essentially you're saying in the first file that ever gets loaded at the very top, here's a namespace. Another file that gets loaded 10 seconds later could say, hi, I'm more resets and I'm for the namespace of reset. And the browser engine will say, well, cool, I loaded it way later. Maybe someone would have used to put it here, but I'm at layer capable and it's specified that it wants to go here. So it inserts it into that top spot. You essentially get to name your cake, all the different layers, user, you know, libraries, blah, blah, blah. And then at any time you load any files, you tell it where it goes. And all of a sudden, that mess, that orchestration mess, that you had no good way to wrangle it and get your hands on it, has nice names for things to go into. You're like, oh, yeah, I know exactly where you go. And you can manage your cake. Yeah, 
That's awesome. You should have called it at cake, I at guess. Cake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds really cool. Um, so that one you have listed as a, a moderate risk. So it's sort of, we, you know, we can start testing and playing around with it, but probably not ready for putting into your production sites quite yet. Yeah, that's like a pre-processor one. Like you could yeah. go play around with the, a very similar feature or maybe even someone has like a post-CSS plugin that emulates the spec. Um, and yeah, you can go feel as an author that you're writing modern mm -hmm. uh, CSS, but you don't deliver it. Yep. Yeah, we'll go to a completely different one. I see you have, um, and you were talking about it before with not getting sort of the Chrome people aren't too, or the engineers aren't too deep into it yet, but the new color specs with the color, color. four and color five. I'm so stoked on color. I was just like, telling my uh, dad about it the other day because he's like, I, what are you doing at work? And I'm like, okay, let me tell you something funny. Okay, dad, remember back in the day uh, when you loaded a website and they were all 800 by 600? And then our screens got bigger, right? Not every computer was the same size. That was weird, right? Not everybody had the same big old CRT monitor. So what the web had to do, the web had to like learn to allow things to move and flex, become fluid inside the space. And the browser's resolution kept getting bigger, which meant our canvas... It got bigger and we needed more ability to create space and utilize that space. And I was like, now imagine if it's been 20 years and the browser was still showing you 800 by 600, even though you had a big, huge monitor. You'd be really frustrated that this web page wasn't taking advantage of the capabilities of your display. Enter color. <laughs> it's the same thing, except the bummer is it's been 15 years and we still only have sRGB. Yeah. We're still using colors and a, and, a, and we're talking about colors and using colors from a very big color spectrum, right? It's got millions of colors or whatever, um, but it's not taking advantage of your display. Your display can show more colors, especially your phone. And we know that looking at analytics, like people are on their phone. Like, so what I'm getting at is like in color level four, you got bigger gamuts. Uh, which means more colors to choose from given a certain way that you want to talk about color. We got different gamuts for different purposes. And so these are things like LCH, uh, which is lightness chroma hue, lab, which is lightness A and B, and A and B are like this funky way you talk about color because the way that's shaped. Anyway, um, so right, we get bigger gamuts. We get uh, different color shapes. So one, like lab is better for gradients kind of interesting. We get in color level five, we get manipulation functions. So this is the ability for you to say, just like you do in SAS, but to have it at runtime, um, you could say, okay, take this color red and just lighten it by 10%, you know, and take that color over here. And um, this ability for you to take a color, chop it up, perform math on it and stick it right back into CSS all at the same time is coming. And then we have like system colors. So we're like, maybe you want to build a website or an app that you don't actually manage any color at all. You're just sort of saying, hey, browser, dark and light theme, I just want these for free. Color my links, color my buttons. I'll just use whatever you provide. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited about these because they, they, it's a way for you to differentiate in your browser. And I think when you ask for hot pink and you ask for lime green, like you want a vibrant color and you don't know right now that you aren't getting a vibrant pink until you go see a vibrant pink in your browser. And so mm -hmm. that's, I have a lot of these talks and stuff where you can go, or like tweets you can go see where I'm like, look at the gradient in sRGB that y'all liked 500 times or whatever. I recreated it in lab and I don't want old sRGB anymore. <laughs> yeah. sRGB looks really bad. It's like, wow, that, that old gradient looks like s salmon. It looks all like the sun burnt it out for like four days, you know, like what it is disgusting. Um, and so, yeah, all these little color things. I just want the web to be able to show color like the displays can. It's like our color, it just fell over on the wayside. And so I'm a member of the working group. I'm helping Chrome push this stuff. And right now Safari's had, Safari's had the ability to display color and display P3 for four years. And it makes sense why you'll open up an iPhone. They want to use the colors. They've spent an amazing amount of time making a retina display that shows as many colors as your eyeball is capable of. And they're like, CSS better as hell be able to access one of those colors. Um, and so, yeah, that's some of the uh, work coming in color level four and five. In color level four, you can um, pre-process your way into color. So you can start using lab and LCH today. And what that'd be doing is you can access colors in this bigger color space, but it essentially delivers an sRGB color. Mm -hmm. So it's called color clamping. Um, and it's still okay. Like maybe you could do your color. Anyway, I think it's advanced uh, colors. Colors quite advanced, um, but that's what I meant by color level yeah, four and yeah. five. Uh, more colors and 
uh, color manipulation functions. Just yeah. really exciting stuff. The next one on your list goes really well in there with the nest. And yeah, yeah. We'll start just with with what. Well, I guess you know, for me being a fan of of SAS, nesting, I think is one of. Well, there's variables that which were, I think, why I started using it. Um, and then now I've abandoned those almost completely just because we have custom properties. Um, but nesting has always been something that I've, I've thought was pretty cool. And so seeing it come to CSS makes me wonder sort of what, the, I guess, uh, we could say just what nesting is, but then also sort of how it could compare to um, preprocessors. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you want to describe what nesting okay, is before so, uh, I... Yeah. Very quickly, say you had a card and then you have an h2 that's in your cards so instead of doing dot card space h2 if you want like a you know you're scoping your your h2 to your card or something like that or, or even if it's a class of title so you have dot card space dot title um, instead of doing that you would have your dot card open curly brace and then on the next line you could just put h2 open curly brace or dot title open curly brace so it knows that that style is nested inside of the card so it becomes like a descendant selector effectively Yep, well done. So yeah, the, you're sort of co-locating um, new child styles into the parent block. And yeah, it just feels right, especially in a card, right? You write card one time, and then all your card styles get to fit inside of that block as you sort of mm -hmm. build out um, higher specificity selectors or just like things within that card that need to be styled. And it's all located in one spot. I'm a huge fan of nesting too. Um, uh, yeah, it was a big reason to start using preprocessors because um, building and just all the repetition, if you don't have a preprocessor, can get really old. Yeah. Um, okay, so then let's talk about at nest. So recently, is and where um, have become very standard and available on all major browsers. Mm -hmm. So uh, a primer on is and where is, is and um, is a functional pseudo selector. So it's kind of like not, where you can say like div colon not pass it the function parameters and in there you can write a complex selector you could say like is not and, and you could type whatever you want in there is not body space main space article h1 you know bold tag like you could say it's not that crazy bold tag so with is you can say what it is <laughs> and you can specify um, additional parameters that it needs to have but why it's especially uh, powerful is it can be used in the middle, in the end, or the beginning of a selector. So it essentially allows you to group. You can take a whole concept of like multiple things because you can put a comma in that parentheses. You can put like open parentheses, you know, selector, comma, selector, comma, selector. And you can put that in the middle of somewhere. So you could say article space uh, is, and you can put h1, h2, h3, h4, h5, h6, and parentheses. So you'd basically just saved yourself a bunch of article space H1, article space H2, articles, but by grouping all of the H1s through H6s into the end of that selector. So at nest builds upon uh, like is by allowing you to build those uh, groups in the beginning, middle, or end, all while you're building inside of that code block. And um, some of the differences that you're going to have in the you know CSS nesting per like real is that it will be tokens when you're when you're building um, these new selectors. So you've got like article open curly brackets, and then you say in this spec you have to always say and if you're building to the right. So in SAS you don't have to. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just sort of start a new selector, and SAS is really good about parsing it out. In the nesting spec, you just have to be explicit that you're starting it because um, and is anyway whatever you always have to have it. And I find that it helps like SAS was a little too loose I think in some cases and the and makes it really obvious anyway so okay so you've got article opening up your brackets then you have and space h1 and you could open up your parentheses there and nest a style for an h1 that's being found inside of an article the and uh, essentially takes the parent token which is a live object it's a live selector object and puts it uh, down where the and is and so it says article space h2 or H1. The difference again here is like in preprocessor land with variables, they were static and they got computed away. You uh, would write with the, all the variables, but the end style sheet didn't have them. Mm -hmm. Same thing with nesting. When you write with nesting in a preprocessor, you you author it, but you don't deliver it. Everything gets squashed and flattened. Um, when we got the spec for uh, variables, they're alive and they're reactive. They're runtime. They are uh, 
right? They're different. They're not a static variable. These are very dynamic in real time. They feel almost like a state store in JavaScript or like this sort of like magical thing that you update it and just goes everywhere. That's going to be very similar with how nesting is going to work. Nesting is not going to be like preprocessors where you are building strings, right? You can't do BEM with a, a runtime nesting structure. You can't. These are real objects. You can't just yes. stick... Well, well, you can stick two selectors together, right? Like dot food and dot bar. Like, but the idea is, at least in BEM, like you're always concatenating to the right, mm -hmm. which I think might be this way on video. But anyway, yeah, you're always like building a string, and you can't build a string when what you're working with aren't strings. You're working with real selectors, live, live selectors, right? And so, anyway, that's one of the big gotchas is that you can't build a BEM selector. But what you could do is you could build BEM in your preprocessor. Uh, nesting style and then deliver some of the more runtime, you mm -hmm. know, slim style sheet that you get from like a runtime uh, delivered nesting. So anyway, those are some of the things you can nest uh, at media queries and you can nest at supports and stuff like that. You just got to make sure the and comes in and why it's called at nest is because you can write um, at, okay, uh, let's see. So and implies that you're going to be building to the right. If you do at nest, so if you had an article, open curly brackets, and then you said at nest, you basically could start a brand new selector and the brand new selector could say a body, uh, you know, direct descendant main. And then you can say, and, and it would take that article and put it at the end of a new selector. And, um, essentially let's, I think you can do this in SAS as well. Um, cause it'd be like a trailing and, and stuff like that, but it essentially lets you put that new context anywhere in a new selector line. And a good example of how we've used this is like, let's say I have a card and the card, I can make it, uh, knowledgeable of its parent using at nest. So in my card styles, I then at the very bottom, I could say at nest container direct descendant dot card colon nth child odd. So if this is an odd nth child, and then I can say and, and so I stick my card uh, selector in there with that and I can open that up. And now I know if my parent has given me the odd uh, reference and as a in the card styles themselves, I can now update my presentation and give myself a different background. So now I have like alternating background cards, all because at nest allowed me to nest a new selector that took the context, but plus a brand new one. Anyway, it's really cool stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that's like, it's, it's pretty hard to describe uh, on a call, but yeah, is and where essentially uh, are powering all of that underneath the hood. So that's when you cool. author nesting, uh, really, it's just is being used to create all those little groupings. Um, and you'll see that in the spec. The spec says, here's the sugar, and here's what the desugaring goes to. And it'll always show you is is being used under the hood. Um, so yeah, that's at Nest. And the ability to deliver that at runtime, so your, your style sheets will be much smaller. And DevTools will show you uh, that you're nesting. So that's one of the other things I get to do is I get to work with the DevTools team. And I'm like, hey, uh, nesting, we're going to need a solution there. It's going to need to look normal. So I'm in Figma. Uh, designing what DevTools needs to look like with nesting and stuff. That's, um, that's kind of cool. It, yeah. it is cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we talked a little bit about scroll timeline when you were talking about polyfills um, and that. So uh, for me, I haven't, I, it's one of those things, there's just so much new stuff coming that I'm always like, I see th these things coming. I'm like, I got to play with that. And then I just haven't, but I keep seeing people tweeting about it. I've definitely seen some of your own and it gets me really excited for them. Yeah. Um, so maybe we won't deep dive exactly, you know, or I mean, I, I don't know. If, let's just, we can talk about scroll time. Like you've done some fun stuff with it. So if you want to dive in, I'm happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> it's so scroll timeline for me is the most exciting thing I've worked on for years. It just, the, the, the demos that I can make are so engaging. I mean, scrolly telling is really fun, right? Where you're like, all these things are flying in and out during scroll it can also be really annoying. So I try not to build anything that's too annoying. Although I am working on something that's quite extravagant <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway um but the idea is like yeah so you've got a, a normally a timeline has like this start and end with an amount of time between it and scroll timeline is going to leverage the amount of scrolling distance as a replacement for that and it allows you to really orchestrate an interface to where things feel very connected um, and it does it at a very performant way. So, right, if we do JavaScript solutions today, we're going to be using request animation frame or the scroll event, which means we're showing up late to the party. Uh, and I just always like that example where it's sort of like, okay, um, the browser is like, all right, I did all my rendering painting. The user scrolled. Everything's good. Okay, now I'm going to call this function for JavaScript. And JavaScript's going to be like, hey, so I need to change this over here, and this needs to go over here. And the browser's like, 
we just did all that work. Didn't, don't you know that uh, you're the frame after, uh, I guess. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, it just has to show up at that time. But at scroll timeline, you're there uh, in the engine with it at the same time. And so you're there included in those passes and it becomes much more performant. Um, and then writing it is really nice. Although it is a little quirky. So like the concept of time is gone, right? You're like, how long does a scroll animation take? Well, it's like, how slow did you scroll? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you have to like right now, one of the spec... Uh, items that's under review, it's like it's probably going to go away, is you have to specify time right now. And time is weird. You're like, but there is no more time. Like, there's right. no duration on this. Why do I have to specify a duration uh, for my scroll timeline? Um, and anyway, there's uh, lessons to be learned inside of there. But you can also do easing, too. So you could change the easing if you wanted. Like, as someone's scrolling, it could start out slow, and as they get to the bottom of the page, like, something whips in. Um, I always find that I like linear, like I like the scroll gesture to be directly tied with some animation in a right. linear fashion, because then my fling, like if I throw something and I get that nice browser uh, resting animation, like with scroll, it does that to my um, animation too. So it's just really nice when you see these things orchestrated and working together. It also goes really well with scroll snap points because you can uh, throw somewhere and it'll rest and the animation rests with it. And they just sort of like move together and snap together. And yeah, there's just a nice little harmony happening there. Um, I see here custom media. So stashing media queries into variables. And this was something, I think a lot of people when custom properties first came out were like, wait, you can't, you can't have a custom property that is yeah. my screen size. What's up with that? Yeah, it's because they're dynamic and it's annoying. Like CSS needs a couple things here. Um, like one of them is we need a const, right? In CSS, we don't actually have the ability to make a variable set as something and then never change again. They're always dynamic. And that's the problem here is you can't put something in the media query um, and then change the value of it later in like another media query. Like that'd be really weird. Or like some new block changes. It just be, it takes away, it's like static nature and its predictability. Um, and then so what this proposal is, is this essentially lets you do it um, and it had like I think there's a spec proposal for it in custom media queries level. Yeah, I don't remember what level it is, um, but preprocessors will let you use it now. And so that's what I tend to do is all um, and that you know right preprocessors you can treat it as static. So it's essentially just repeated throughout the whole end thing that I deliver. But at least I get to author it as if it was um, I wrote it once. Right, I get to stay dry as an author. Maybe I deliver something that's wet, but whatever. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um. Reduced data. Yeah. Okay. So um, browsers, like since Opera 1, maybe, or whatever Opera version came out where they had that data saver mode where they were like, yes. browse with us and we are going to shave off all the poo poo off that page. We're going to crunch the page even. We're going to do it on our own servers. Um, and you can intentionally surf the web in this reduced mode. Mm -hmm. And they called it like a light mode or something. Chrome also has a light mode, so you can browse the web and it will request less images. And it does like, it, it tries to do work to sort of save you from using too much data because sometimes data is really expensive. Um, and now we have it in our operating systems. So on your phone, your iPhone, your Android have this ability to be in a reduced data state where, yeah, you're like, hey, I'm camping. You know, don't download that video or whatever. Um, and so CSS and well, and, and JavaScript has APIs for this. The server has APIs for this. Um, like a server, if it's someone is visiting and has this data saver enabled, there's little headers that the server can say, well, I guess I'll reply with less packets for this user. JavaScript can look to see uh, what the internet connection speed is of a user and uh, do some other network assessment checks before it makes a request and can be smart and, and you know, mindful of a user's prefers reduced data. And this is CSS's ability to do it. And it's just like um, preferring reduced motion or preferring higher contrast, you can prefer reduced data. And so this would come back as true if the user is browsing in a browser with that light mode or if their operating system is set to reduce data. And that means in CSS, you could just say, well, okay, that video element, display hidden or display none um, and save this user um, from like downloading that huge asset by getting rid of it out of the DOM and then the browser won't go fetch it or whatever strategy you want to use there. But it's essentially like, how can you be really respectful of a user who wants a reduced data set? Uh, like just doesn't want to download a bunch of stuff. And I made a demo recently where uh, like if you on a set top box with your remote and you're on your couch 
and you load up the page and it's always got like title, 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 and then like a whole row of media. And what I did is I was like, okay, if I'm browsing in a reduced data state, I don't want to see the thumbnails. I just want to know the titles. So I could go through all the horror movies. I could go through all the comedy movies uh, without the thumbnail at all. And like it saves the page thousands of kilobytes. Um, and the user gets to get their goal done. Their goal is just like to browse some titles and, and pick a movie. So like if they're in a reduced data state, just save them. from, And they get this basically like a text document that they get to move through and click an item. And it's like no big deal. Uh, anyway, I'm just really excited about like how do we make these documents and these apps that we make just sort of transparently adapt to users? So users are going around with all these different preferences and stuff coming with them. And every time they visit a page, they don't have to care or hit a switch in the page to get a certain experience. The experience just sort of happens. And reduced data is like one of those things that when you want reduced data, it's really important. And maybe you don't right now because I'm on, you know, Fi. Uh, well, not Fi. Anyway, I have like a lot of internet right here. I'm in Seattle. Um, but yeah, I don't always have that. And sometimes it'd be really nice. So I, yeah, I like these adaptive uh, uh, features coming to CSS. They're just really cool. Yeah. And that's also when it's giving the author, like us as the author, the control um, instead of it. You know, as you said, like the browser will automatically make those decisions. Sometimes I've, I've definitely had it on my phone or it goes, you know, I'm, I'm roaming or whatever. or I'm not on my Wi-Fi and it says you know, we saved you 14 megabytes loading this page. And I'm like, what, did, what am I not seeing? Like, you know, yeah. uh, how did they make that decision? So I don't know if they just come in with lower image quality or what, but it, you know, being a, giving the author, I think more control um, based on the intent is I think a really, a really good thing. Yeah. Okay. Number eight on your list was the at property. And I remember yeah. when I first saw it, I was a little bit confused and then I played with it and I'm like, oh, okay, uh, that's cool. Um, so for anybody who, you know, if you're, if you've used custom properties, you might've been thought maybe there's things you can do with them that you don't, you can't <laughs> is one way to, to think of it. And my, the, what I wanted to do with it, I'm like, Oh, I have custom properties. I know I can't animate a gradient, uh, cause it's a background image. I can't, you know, it, we come in like that. So you, but maybe I could animate my custom property and it wasn't letting me do it. And then I saw, well, now I can do it with the app property because I sort of can declare more I guess you're, you're giving the browser more information about what that property is. Yeah, very nice. I like to think about it as um, um, you're turning like a custom property, which is loose. So if you're talking about like loose and strict programming, uh, loose is like JavaScript, a variable can get to, to, to get declared, put a number in it, put a string in it, put anything else in it later, change it to a string, to a number, right? It's like, I'm just a container and I don't care what I hold versus a typed variable that says I am a number of variable. And if you try to put anything other than a number in me, I get really angry. In fact, I get so angry, I crash your app. Um, <laughs> right. And so what app property is essentially saying, okay, every custom property you make in CSS is willy nilly. And I mean, willy nilly, you can put anything you want in between that colon and that semicolon and custom properties go cool. It's in my brain or whatever. Um, and there, anyway, we have like a episode on custom properties in the CSS podcast where we cover some of this stuff. But what app property does is it shows up and it types that. It takes the willingness, willy nilliness away. Ooh, that's funny saying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, and you, you type it, and what you get from typing it is, yeah, okay. So let's say you have a box shadow or you have a gradient, and essentially you build this like string with parameters, right? Because we don't have box shadow x and box shadow y uh, and box shadow size, right? We just have box shadow. So we have to supply the whole string at once all the time. Same thing with a linear gradient. You don't get linear gradient gradient one color as like a sub property, right? You just pass the whole thing together. And so what you do is you can take a piece of it. And I like to think of it like a scalpel and you cut out just one little part, like talk about like box shadow and its size, right? So the ability for it to grow or not. And you can take out just that one little piece, make it a custom property. Now, if you make it a custom property and it's not defined with app property yet, and you were to try to animate that size, like go from zero pixels to 10 pixels, you wouldn't get an animation yet um, because that that property is still willy nilly. And the browser can't rely on the fact that you won't pass it a string still. Because if you do pass it a string still, it has to obey and it will just fail the, the box shadow. So app property says, okay, okay, I hear you browser. I hear you. It's too willy nilly. Let me give you some more information about this so that you can do something smart with it. Like I want to pass a length into my size. I just want it to be a pixel value. 
So I'm going to go say app property, uh, my shadow size, and I'm going to say uh, inherits. You can specify whether it inherits. You can say its default value, it's zero pixels. And then you can say what type it accepts. And you can say it accepts lengths. And you can say all sorts of stuff. There's like a cool interface for creating custom properties here where you're basically typing a custom property like what you would do in TypeScript or something. You're defining it up front like a schema. Now the browser goes, ah, this custom property will not be a string sometimes. If it is, I reject it. And I keep along with what I was doing before. It has error type safety in it, uh, like just like classic CSS does. And so then what you can do though is now if you go to animate it, so if you hover and you set that app property, custom property to 10 pixels, the browser can intelligently go from zero pixels to 10 pixels, not just intelligently, but confidently. And that's how you're able to do linear gradient animations, box shadow animations now, uh, because well, just more succinct ones, is because you are, you're taking a piece of that, typing it, making it very explicit about its range of what it can be, and you essentially take it out of the, it can't be animated, and you turn it into something that can be animated. Um, it has other cool features, like you could type every single one of your design tokens if you wanted to, like you could go really, really, uh, off the deep end with app property just out of like type safety and other just i don't know if you wanted to and the support of it's really uh pretty good right now and so yeah app property you're just tightening up that definition so that you get additional superpowers uh next on your list was aspect ratio which i think is so you know now that we have it it's like why didn't we have this before <laughs> seriously I, yeah. I use it all the time I, I even use like just to make boxes i'm like aspect ratio one yeah. I'm like, now I don't have to worry about height. I'm just like, yeah, whatever the width was, you know, yeah. do it. I, I was doing it where I would be making, if I wanted a box, I'd have like a custom property for the size. And then I'd put that for the width and the height just so I could just update it in one place and I'd always yep. get it. So I'm like, oh, I don't have to do that anymore. That's nice. <laughs> yep. There's a lot of dash dash sizes at the top of like yep. certain divs. Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Very common. Yep. <laughs> um, um, yeah. What? So yeah, other use case that you have for it? I think you just put out an episode on it where you were like, here's the padding hack and here's aspect ratio. Um, I definitely looked at it quickly. And yeah, we were sort of comparing it to the padding hack just because for anyone who doesn't know, an interesting thing with CSS, and I'm pretty sure it's to prevent recursion from happening, is padding top and bottom, the same as margin top and bottom, are based on the width. If they're a percentage, are based on the width of that element and not the height of the element. <coughs> Excuse me. Because if they were based on the height, it could cause recursion and we'd have all sorts of problems. So they're based on the width. So if you give something a padding top of 100%, it's going to match the width of the element. So you can control, and there's all the different maths. You can look it up and find all the different sort of maths and percentages you can use to get different aspect ratios. And that used to be the only way, and you'd have absolute positioning to get things to be in the right place. So your text could actually be on top of it, and it's not just a big box of padding. And yep. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it, it worked, but it was definitely not ideal. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, now we can just say set a width aspect ratio is twelve over nine, and it works. <laughs> it's pretty cool. It is super cool, and I feel like it has a good um, upgradeability. Like I delivered a demo recently. I think it's that same media scroller where it's like all the movie titles. Um, and I'm like, if you don't have aspect ratio, then all three sets of um, movies, they all look the same. You get boxes all the way down. If you do have aspect ratio, though, the top ones are boxes. The middle ones are 16 by 9. And the bottom ones are 4 by 3. It's like all I have to do is in one at supports media query is update a couple of different places with an aspect ratio. And I'm done. And I've like drastically upgraded the visual quality of a page, which is this tiny amount of CSS. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's, I think, you know, a really good use case there where you're progressively enhancing the page if somebody has it. And if they don't, it's fine. They're still yeah. getting a, a very workable experience. So, yeah. One thing <laughs> before I let you go uh, is just really quickly with all these things that are coming and um, you know, for me, CSS for a long time was really stagnant. And now then it sort of had this, you know, CSS three came where we got everything at once. And then it's sort of, since then we've slowly been growing and it seems to be speeding up again. Uh, there seems to be a lot yes. of things just coming. Um, and imagine for newer people, like, can, you know, you hear people like us talking about it that are all, you know, super excited for all these new things coming. Um, but I can imagine for some people it's a bit over like, holy moly, like, uh, I know for myself, one of the reasons I loved it, just HTML, CSS and vanilla JavaScript and, you know, let's keep things simple. You can make, or even just HTML, CSS, you can make a nice website. You don't need to use that many properties to get it done. You need a few HTML tags. 
Um, and it and it just seems that then the whole JavaScript world exploded with you know the different frameworks and other things, and um, there was sort of a level of complexity that got added to that. Um, the whole front of the front and front of the back um, worlds that you know the front end development seems to be getting more complicated, and now that also seems to a certain extent to be coming to CSS. Um, so I'm just curious what your thoughts are there for either for I guess it's a multi pronged question. But for yeah. people that are new to CSS, just if they do feel overwhelmed uh, or just front-end development in general, and I guess like the pluses and minuses in your mind of, of it all. Yeah. What a lovely question. I wish I had a beer to sip <laughs> while I answered it, um, just because there's you guys so many feels in so many different ways. Um, so yeah, CSS3 was nice and sort of tried to name a whole bunch of new stuff for us. CSS4 is probably not going to happen. Although I think there is at least one or two like pivot points you could probably identify as like, here's a cutoff where CSS3's stuff ended and here's all the brand new stuff that CSS4 is bringing, like logical properties, add supports, add property. Um, anyway, there's like all these cutoffs that you could sort of say, this is modern CSS4 and that's CSS3 and back. I, I agree, the surface area of learning CSS has grown immensely. Um, and it's classic, like CSS has this unique um, issue, which is that it's super easy to get started with. Overflow, or uh, yeah, wait, yeah, is it overflow? Yeah, not overflow auto, right? Okay, so it's like, I want this to be scrollable. Overflow auto. Um, I don't know why I forgot that property, but anyway. And it's like, okay, I have scrolling now. And it's like, but what if I want to do this? And then, which naturally most people want to do, they have like an idea or like a design goal. And then, so while CSS was easy to get started with, it's really hard to master, right? You're going to have to create some sort of orchestration of flex and grid to get the proper scrollable area that you want that has the proper scrollable padding that aligns with this other thing. Like it can get really complex really fast while also being really easy to get started with. That's one of my favorite things about it though. I'm still learning about it. I don't want to stop learning. I'm not interested in mastering CSS. I don't think that that would bring me happiness nor coolness. Um, I really appreciate the subtleties of what it can do sometimes. And it's almost like, um, you know, like, okay, you have tools and you have skills. You could have every single tool in your garage and have no skills and you can't build anything. You could have all the skill in the world of like how to build something, but not one tool and well, you're not going to build anything. So it's like you have to kind of like put these both together. Um, and I'm constantly just using new CSS features that are like tools. And then I'm building my skills to see how these things weave in with all these other scenarios. And so I'm just constantly building, constantly learning um, the amount of complexity that CSS alone can have in the front end, right? It starts out as a box. Oh, I get paid to put boxes on the screen. Hey, you're a famous box placer, Kevin. <laughs> you know, you're, like, you're like, yeah, that's true. It does start as one box, uh, but then all of a sudden your box is in a box. And then we also know that like a box has like an inner box and an outer box. At least that's how I think about CSS boxes. And you're just like, what? Each box is actually kind of two? We are like, yeah, it's a box in a member of other boxes, but it itself is a box with boxes. You know, it's like, oh. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I think you just kind of have to keep working on this stuff. I think CSS is unique in that there's a feel to it. It's not compute work. JavaScript, backend work, you're doing a lot of compute. Um, and the front end has all these different user requirements and people have to use it. So there's like a lot of feel that gets in there. And so you just kind of keep hacking through all the feels, keep making sure that your mom feels comfortable on it and your partner feels comfortable on it. And like everyone is like, and you just kind of like get this interface into this place where no one thinks about your interface anymore. And now they're just getting stuff done. And I just like finding that. It's like, you could have the coolest car in the whole world. It's got the sickest engine on it. But if that steering wheel and that shifter suck, well then your car sucks, sorry. It's like odd that even like a house, like you could have built an amazing house and just the stairs going up to it could be too steep. And you're like, sorry, not buying the house. You're like, but it's just stairs. You're like, dude, this house, I can't even walk up to it. And so it's like this user experience, the way that we feel as we're using really complex stuff is so important. And I think what, what we're going to see over time is, well, CSS is growing really fast. It's getting more features where we're letting more people see our documents and have good experiences at these documents and these apps. Um, and the I think the front end user experience side, this feeling side, 
um, is going to be the most complex part of application development eventually. I think all the compute, data flinging, database scaling, all this other stuff is kind of getting normalized uh, or it's like it's just like kind of solved or whatever, but like the people side is just so hard. So keep hacking, stay at learning mentality because CSS is just going to keep growing. This stuff is not getting simpler. We're getting more screens, more colors, more feature requests from users. Uh, your job security is great. And I think the amount of learning trajectory and the, like the runway that we have is so long. Like I don't, I'm just not going to get bored in CSS. I have things to study for so many more years to come. And that's what I want. I don't want to go hit an end uh, and need to pivot. I like that there's still so much to give to me. And then plus you throw JavaScript in there with CSS and it's like, whoa, now the world is like, <laughs> I can do whatever I want at any time I want. Ah! And it's so cool. Um, yeah. I don't know. Did I answer your question? I yeah, just... 100%. That is awesome. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, I thought, uh, actually, just one one quick, quick question here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you think some of the new features are adding complexity just for complexity's sake? Ooh, okay. So this hits me hard. Um, adding, so at layer is going to add a lot of complexity. I think it will solve more than it's taking. Here's a good way that I look at complexity, because um, this happened in JavaScript for me for many, many years, is... Um, how much am I, oh, let's see, uh, you have to look at how much you get back for what you put in. Because what you want is high return. You want to barely write anything and get a really sick experience. At scroll time and scroll snap points, deliver. Barely write anything, you get these gorgeous interactive 60 frame per second experiences. I'm like, ready, I'm here for that. Now, things like Shadow DOM and at scope, they sound like they're going to simplify your life they do not. <laughs> so get ready for the concept of isolating an element as becoming your new annoying thing to deal with because, well, it's isolated. And well, now all the things that you wanted to get in there aren't getting in there. And you're like, oh, crap. Uh, I guess there was like a bunch of stuff getting in there that I wanted. And I just didn't realize I wanted. And now I have to explicitly go want it. And it's annoying. Um, but that one always, ah, oh, so that one you have to accept that complexity for the value that you're getting, which is isolation. And I don't know, that one is not just complexity for complexity's sake. Let's see if there's any that are that way in this list here. Reduce data, add property, aspect ratio. I could look at the other ones. Color is, I think the value is there. Um, no, I haven't really felt that complexity for complexity's sake in CSS very often. Um, I feel it way more often in JavaScript land. Um, but yeah, not here. No, people aren't competing for really complex, cool hotness in CSS as much. They're doing that in JavaScript, um, right? We don't like we don't get performance metrics where people are like drilling, like how many sticky items can you make sticky in one second? You're like, dude, I just don't. Doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> So yeah, complexity. Um, it's so hard to judge too for me because I'm I'm getting advanced at CSS now, and so I'm losing mm -hmm. sight of some of the beginner um, things. And I know that is is really complex. Um, is and where is takes the highest specificity of its yeah. passed in parameters, which can be a foot gun for people or a superpower. Like I used it the other day to actually win a specificity, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh cool, I'll just throw a random ID. I threw a random ID in there. It's a hashtag fooey. And all of a sudden, my style started working when I hovered on an element. And I was like, well, that's interesting and fun. Um, <laughs> complexity, yeah. I think the front end is the most complex space. And I think that that alone, it, it just, it's a, it, yeah, you don't really have control on the front end. You're, you're, you receive data, you receive a user that has a screen. And like, all, all you'd get to do is make requests. You're like, uh, can the, text color be blue, please. Yeah, we're like, nope, the user overrode it. Oh, great, okay, well, that's whatever they did. And so, yeah, it's like everything is like a request and you're at the, the forefront of everything converging. Everything's converging <laughs> right here in your environment. I think it's just really complex. I think even basic things like a form, it's really complex. Um, I don't know how to get out of complexity yet. All I know is that, yeah, I think things are actually getting more complex in the front end. Even as we get more features that allow us to do things more succinctly, if you don't know the option is there, yeah. then you're not going to use it and you're still going to... No, I, I don't know. I think our world is just more complex than anyone wants to admit it. And they want to sell you on things that make it easier. Oh, you know, download this thing and you become this much stronger and your life is that much easier. And I'm like, nah, -uh. 
it's still going to be complex. You yeah. could go get a really cool power tool at you know the store down the street to do your home task. Sorry, the task is still complex and still difficult. And the tool might even add more complexity because, well, it requires a new skill and you don't have the skill to actually leverage it yet. Um, man, that's a tough one. I think complexity is inevitable. And I think simplicity is the hardest thing to deliver. I think it's really easy to deliver complex stuff and really hard to actually make something simple. As as we, I think as you, we develop these new tools, then you realize, oh, look, there's these other use cases that we have other tools that we could create. And it's a little bit like we said before, we're, we're relying on things that we built that then we can now leverage those to build new other ones for these other situations. And it does add to the complexity, but it's also, I think most of the time is solving relevant problems or else we wouldn't be hopefully putting this many man hours into it. <laughs> yeah. CSS has a lot of great complexity blockers. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like the CSS working group might be one of the reasons that we don't see a lot of unnecessarily complex things creeping in is they're just very, I don't know, very careful. They're a little timid um, and that's kind of nice, I guess. One of the things that I'm most excited about that Adam talked about there is at Scroll Timeline and Adam actually joined me for another sit down, but in that one, we actually went into the code and played around with it and learned how it works. So if you'd like to check that out, that video is right here for your viewing pleasure. And with that, a really big thank you to my supporters of Awesome, Zach and Randy over on Patreon, as well as all my other patrons for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more awesome. I edited it, edited it, edited it, edited it, edited it, edited it, cut it down a little bit.